what does it mean for music to sound epic? You know what I'm talking about. The specific brand of heroic or adventurous music that makes up a ton of modern superhero movie and action game soundtracks. The kind of music you can hear scoring our hero's last stand, or a last ditch dive behind enemy lines, or a mission to defeat an extraterrestrial existential threat with your loyal crew with almost no chance of survival. This kind of music is all over the place, and it all uses a very specific vocabulary of musical ideas, some obvious and some not so much. A perfect example of this vocabulary is Mass Effect 2's Suicide Mission theme. The music for the final mission in the game was actually the first to be composed, according to an interview with composer Jack Wall. The piece uses a hybrid synth and orchestral approach, the orchestra providing an epic scale to the futuristic sci-fi synth sounds that manages to bring your dozens of hours long intergalactic journey to a climactic and satisfying conclusion. After studying Suicide Mission's theme, I can see three things that are required to make music feel epic. Heroism, gravitas, and a sense of scale. Almost all modern heroic music that we find in films and games keeps to a strict harmonic vocabulary that follows a couple of simple rules. First, the chord progression has got to be in a minor key, but use mostly major chords. That means, if we're in the key of D minor, we're going to use our tonic D minor chord to establish the key, but besides that, we'll be using mostly B flat and C chords with maybe some F thrown in too. Leave the A minor and E diminished chords at home. The chord progressions have to be completely diatonic too, meaning we're not using any notes from outside the key we're in, with the exception of the major 4 chord, G major in the key of D minor. This is used all the time as a way to present a twist, to take a surprising brighter turn at a key point in the music. Suicide Mission is written in D minor and follows these rules to a T, and then expands on them. After establishing our D minor tonality and 7-8 time signature with this repeated synth line, we are presented with this chord progression. D minor to B flat to C to G sus. It's clearly in a minor key, but using all major chords besides the tonic. The 4 chord here, G, contains neither a major or minor third anywhere, leaving the quality ambiguous to avoid either bringing in a minor chord to sully the heroic atmosphere, or blowing the major 4 chord twist too early. A lot of the music in this world uses loops of four chords or fewer, and these four chords by themselves would make a perfect loop. The G would move nicely to the D minor chord at the top to start the whole thing over. But Suicide Mission instead leads this G up to a B flat to start a second half of what ends up being an eight chord loop that will run through the whole piece. D minor to B flat to C to G sus, to B flat to F to G sus to D minor. Moving by a fourth from B flat to F here creates a sense of resolution, a secondary 4 to 1 cadence that briefly feels like we've shifted to the key of F major. But this F chord pivots back to D minor by moving up to another ambiguous thirdless G chord, giving us a flat 3 to 4 to 1 cadence. Note the use of the raised sixth of the key, B natural, over this final D minor chord, piercing the rest of the music with a flash of color. Four chord loops can get pretty old pretty fast, and so building an eight chord loop instead maintains interest without ever having to deviate from this pattern as we move through the piece. More than that though, I'm impressed by how Wall built a chord progression that has a sense of direction, that 
twists and turns and tells a story without ever stepping out of the vocabulary from which this style of music draws. It's a pretty limited palette of chord movements to choose from, but the piece makes the most of it to take you away from where you think you're going and then bring you back home in a convincing way. Writing minor key music, using mostly major chords, gets at that heroic feeling of light cutting through the darkness. You don't need a hero if everything is fine, after all, and establishing a minor key sets an appropriately dire environment that allows for heroic rays of hope to shine through. The sense of heroism is obviously crucial to heroic music, but it also needs a sense of gravity. Epic music has to take itself seriously. It has to convey the crucial life and death importance of the mission at hand. Suicide Mission achieves this effect using what we call in the music snob business, oblique motion. In counterpoint, or the study of how multiple independent melodies interact with each other, there are three different categories of motion between two simultaneous lines. Parallel motion is when the two voices move in the same direction. Contrary motion is when the two voices move in different directions. And oblique motion is when one voice moves while the other voice stays on the same note. We can take this concept out of the world of counterpoint and extrapolate it to an arranging technique where you keep one musical element in place while another musical element moves around it. If we can return to the very beginning of the piece, you'll remember our repeating 7-8 synth figure. This figure winds its way down the D minor scale from the 5th to the root and repeats every bar through our entire 8 chord loop. This is a static element of the music that provides contrast to the other parts of the arrangement moving through our chord progression, and it creates some intricate harmonies as the two elements interact. Against the B flat chord, these five notes from D minor hit the major 7th and sharp 11th, over the C chord we get this lovely 6th and the colorful crunch between the 4th and 3rd, and we get the sound of a dominant 9th chord without the 3rd over this G. These are super colorful harmonies that you wouldn't find in action music in any other context. There's some element of oblique motion present in just about every section of this piece, even when the synth line leaves and the orchestra comes in. This section sees a repeated string figure walking up from the root to the third of D minor. It starts off playing in octaves over our D minor chord, but as the progression continues, the lower strings shift the figure around to fit each chord, while the higher octave stays on that D, E, F line. The motion of the bottom line recontextualizes the static top line with each shift, bringing out a beautiful quality by harmonizing it a tenth below, or an uncomfortable crunch by hitting a minor ninth interval over these C chords. between these two figures creates a sense of seriousness. We really get the feeling that something significant is happening in the music. The piece moves into a breakdown in 3-4 time that begins exploring more mixing between synthetic and orchestral sounds. We see another example of oblique motion between a static figure against a moving chord progression as this new looping synth line, taken from the main theme of the very first Mass Effect game, sticks to an F major 7 arpeggio while the chords underneath continue the suicide mission progression. This section also features a more textbook example of oblique motion as it introduces the choir. These two harmonizing voices trade off between holding a note while the other voice moves down the scale. There's a sincerity you can feel in these choir parts, which I attribute to the use of oblique motion on a note-to-note -note level and as the larger approach to the arrangement of the piece. 
Heroism and gravitas are important elements, but it's just not going to be epic music if it doesn't sound huge. If we jump to the climax of the piece where it's firing on all cylinders, you can see an orchestration formula that you've likely heard many times before. Cellos, basses, and sub-bass work together to lay down an impenetrable bass line. Bellowing, bestial, low brass, soaring horn melodies, the high strings screaming up in their highest register, rhythmic repeated chanting in the choir, and of course the pounding of big deep drums anchoring the whole ensemble. A lot of the sounds used for epic music evoke contexts of battle. The pounding of war drums, the sounding of horns, or the rhythmic chanting of a choir of the sort that you could imagine an army doing as they make their march toward the enemy. These sounds of primal warfare are an interesting juxtaposition against the distant future advanced civilization of Mass Effect. No matter our place in history or our technological mastery, people are always going to go to war. We're always going to need heroes. We're always going to have an unbreakable connection to those elements that define so much of human life for so long. That's what makes this music so perfect for the climax of a game like this. That sense of taking on a battle you might not make it out of for the good of your tribe or country or species is powerful. I'm eternally grateful that I was born late enough in history not to have to run into a ditch somewhere to get my head cut off, don't get me wrong, but the sense of camaraderie and purpose and excitement that comes along with that is exactly what Suicide Mission's music is able to tap into, and I think that's a big part of why it's a beloved piece of music, and why people enjoy epic music so much in general. The word epic gets thrown around maybe too much, in this video for sure at least, but we need it. We need to be able to deliver such a thrilling climax at the end of such a big game the way that Suicide Mission manages to do. This grand scale, the unshakable seriousness, and the heroic sense of hope all work together to make the Suicide Mission music truly epic. And I wouldn't have ever thought to analyze it without my patron Caleb George suggesting this piece over on my Patreon. If you want to join Mr. George in supporting the channel, you can find my Patreon via the link in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and a special rest in peace to all of my squadmates who I killed trying to beat this game back in 2010.